verses 9 through 16. On the morrow, on me, <laughs> on the morrow. See, my name, my birth name is in the Bible, morrow. <laughs> I'll tell you, that must make me something special. <laughs> on the morrow, as they went on their journey and drew nigh unto the city, Peter went up upon the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And he became very hungry and would have eaten. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and a certain vessel descending upon him as it had been a great sheet knit at the four corners and let down to the earth wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air and there came a voice to him rise Peter kill and eat but Peter said not so Lord for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean and the voice spake unto him again the second time what God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. This was done thrice, three times. And the vessel was received up again into heaven. Isn't it funny that sometimes God will speak to us and we won't listen the first time, so he has to repeat himself. The Bible said this happened thrice. That means the whole conversation happened three times. Arise, Peter, kill and eat. No, Lord, I can't. I've never eaten anything uncommon. Why would the Lord have done it again and said it again unless Peter said his part again? Hello now. So God talks to us sometimes we don't want to listen. Let's pray before I... I'm trying to preach my message before I even get to praying. Amen. <laughs> Father, we love you so very, very much and we are grateful, God. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful presence of the Holy Ghost we are enjoying in the house of God today. Master, I am an old-fashioned preacher, and I know I am, and I understand, God, that there is no preaching that can touch the heart and the life and the soul of a man or a woman, a boy or a girl, except it be anointed of the Holy Ghost. For the word of God said, No man cometh unto the Father except the Spirit draw him. Lord, I need you today by your spirit to draw my audience in. I need you today by your spirit to confirm the word that I would preach to in the heart of the hearer so that they will receive it as a word from God and they will not simply hear it and receive it as a pretty little sermon that pastor put together. Master, I've sought you, and I've desired of you direction. I've asked you, God, I've prayed, and I've asked you, Lord, give me a word for your church, God, every Sunday. I don't want to preach some pretty little uh, tidy message. I want to deliver a word from heaven. I want to be able to declare, thus saith the Lord. Master, I believe today you've given me a word of encouragement a word of exhortation that is just that. It is a word from the Lord. Master, in the name of Jesus, anoint my lips, anoint the ear of every hearer, those in this place, those watching, those who will later watch and listen by reason of the internet. For we ask it in that precious saving name, Jesus. Amen. Praise God and amen. amen. Peter went up on the roof of the house where he was staying so that he could pray. There is, and I'm incorporating into my message today, I told you earlier that some people are seeking the Holy Ghost and they need some instruction. Well, here comes that instruction. Sometimes you need to separate yourself 
and you need to get away from distractions. You know, you need to, uh, you need to get away from the television. You need to get away from the kids. You need to get away from the husband, the wife, the partner. You need to get away from chatterboxes. You need to get away from the neighbor that's always coming over for coffee. Uh, you know, you need to get away from the dishes. You need to get away from the vacuum. You just need to separate yourself. What was I talking about earlier? Talking about worshiping God in holiness. Holiness is about separating yourself. It's about setting yourself apart. Every time God wanted to talk with somebody, you'll notice he never talked to them when they were in a crowded room. Amen. He didn't talk to Moses while Moses was living in Jethro's house. No, he didn't talk to Moses while Moses was in Egypt in the Pharaoh's house. No, he waited till Moses was a shepherd and Moses out in the middle of a field with all these sheep. Now listen carefully what I'm about to say. Then he still needed to separate Moses. To talk to Moses, he still needed to get Moses away from now the sheep. I'm going to tell you something. I took Pepper with me up to the mountain a couple weeks ago. He had never been, you know. And I've been dying to bring the dogs up. I want them, you know, to experience the good air. And, you know, I want them to enjoy the environment. I brought Pepper with me. Do you know having Pepper with me changed the nature of my whole trip? You know, it changed everything because it was almost like having a baby with you. You know, now you got to take him out to walk. Now you got, while I'm working, I've got to be mindful he might need to come outside and go potty. You know, I got to make sure he eats. I got to make sure he's got water. I was going to spend the night in the cabin. Now it got cold that, that particular night. I had already spent the night up there when it was 20 degrees. So I know I can handle 20 degrees. But I, I put... Poor Pepper, he'd come in the, the cottage, and he got up on the cot, you know, and he would just shake and just so cold, and I felt so bad. Because here at the house, we don't leave him outside. He's an indoor dog, you know. And I'm working, so because I'm working, I'm pretty warm. <laughs> I'm feeling, you know, I'm not feeling any the worse for wear. But there's my poor dog just <clears throat> freezing on that bed. And finally, I said, I sent Tommy a text, and I said, I'm going to go into town and get a motel room because I can't do this to Pepper. I can't do it to him. Honestly, I couldn't because I was trying to get stuff done. If I could have just crawled in the sleeping bag with him, you know, and kept him warm, it would have been one thing. But I had stuff to do, you know. I said, I can't do this to him. So we went down into town. We rented us a motel room. And, of course, he's happy as a clam, and he slept on this great big old king-size bed with me, you know. But he changed the whole trip. He literally provided enough distraction so that virtually everything I did, I had to do with Pepper in mind. And I'm not saying I didn't have my prayer meeting going up. I did. But every once in a while, I'd have some say, Pepper, baby, you're a good boy, Pepper. You're doing such a good job, Pepper. Because he didn't like being in the car either. Most dogs love being in the car, not Pepper. Whoever had him before we got him, I'm afraid they didn't treat him very well. I'm serious. I, I don't know what they did to him, but he's a very nervous dog. A very, you know. The whole trip was changed. Now, I went up there this weekend. I was all by myself. I didn't have Pepper with me. Guess what? Oh, I mean to tell you, I had revival going up. I had revival coming down. I had a prayer meeting the whole time I was up there. I just had a wonderful time. Why? Because I was separated from everything and everyone. Moses was tending sheep. And God could have simply come down from the mountain and said, Moses, come over here, child. I need to talk to you. But instead, he set a bush on fire that was not consumed by the flames. And Moses sees a flame burning up there. And he sees smoke. Now, anybody knows when you see a flame, it's going to spread. But he sees that flame, and he probably sat there and looked at it for an hour or two and said, now wait a minute, something's very odd, because that flame is burning in one spot, and it's not spreading. Something, what is that? What's going on? 
So he decided he'd go investigate. And Moses climbed that mountain. Oh, God loves when we put forth effort. Hello now. To meet with him. That's why we have church services. That's why we have meeting times. Because God loves when we put forth effort to meet with Him. How many of us in this room love it and appreciate it when somebody throws us a birthday party or an anniversary party and friends take out the time not to call you on the phone and say, well, happy anniversary, happy birthday. No, they take out the time and they set apart time to leave their job, to leave their kids, to leave their house, to come to that place where you're going to have your celebration so they can be there to honor you. Don't you appreciate that? Got news for you. God loves when people take the time and put forth the effort to come and meet with him at a place and a time that is set apart and set aside for that meeting. So God called Moses. He, he drew Moses' attention to the mountain. Moses climbs the mountain, and when he gets to within sight of the burning bush, the word of God said he heard a voice coming out of the bush that said, Moses, take off your shoes, because the place where you're now standing is what? is holy ground. Why was it holy ground? Because it was separate. Because it was set apart. Do you follow what I'm saying? That ground wasn't holy just because it was holy. You know, that somehow or another at the top of Mount Sinai was a holy place. No, 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 no. It was holy because God was there. It was holy because it was a separate, sanctified space that God had chosen to occupy. And he didn't leave his space to come meet with Moses at home while he was watching Jimmy Swagger on television. <laughs> he didn't choose to come down off the mountain and Moses see a burning fiery bush walking down the mountain to meet him. No, he called Moses up the mountain. Every time after that Moses needed to talk with God, where did Moses go? He went up the mountain. Yeah. Isn't that funny? Bill, not one time did God come down to talk to Moses in the valley. No, every single time Moses had to climb that mountain all over again. When Moses got the Ten Commandments, he didn't get them down in the valley because God sent them to him through T.D. Jake's television show. I'm, talk, I'm applying this in a modern level, amen? No, he had to climb the mountain to get those Ten Commandments. Then on top of that, they were carved in stone by the finger of God. He had to carry them down the mountain. It takes effort, folks, to live for God. It takes effort to worship God. It takes effort to be faithful to the house of God, to be faithful to our walk with God. Yeah, it takes effort. I'm not going to tell you it doesn't. No, you can't live for God by living at home and worshiping God at home and not being part of a church. i got news for you. No, you cannot do that. You can think you can do that all you want to. That is not what the Word of God teaches. Word of God teaches that we're supposed to love one another enough to want to come together. I'm going to tell you something. I can be mad as a hornet at you. And that don't mean I stop loving you. If you got a problem where you get mad at somebody and you stop loving them because you're mad at them, you got a problem. Am I telling the truth? Johnny, I'd be willing to bet you you get plenty mad at this one over here sometimes. <laughs> Bill, I bet there are times you get so mad you about want to leave the house. I know I do. Don't tell Tommy. There are times I about want to leave the house and I'm not sure I want to come back. I get so aggravated. But you know what? I can get mad at you and never for one minute stop loving you. Amen. Folks, in the church, we need to learn to act like Christians. Just because you get mad at the preacher don't mean you quit coming to church. Just because you get... I have never one time in my life, 53, I've never left the church because I got mad at the preacher. And I got mad at the preacher, oh, plenty of times. <laughs> Has the preacher said things hurt my feelings or made me upset? Yeah. Did the preacher said things I disagree with? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Have I left the church over it? Not one time. Not one time. You know why? Because I still love my pastor. 
My pastor don't have to be perfect for me to love him. I got news for you. You better be grateful today. You don't have to be perfect for your pastor to love you. Because mm -hmm. even though you might think you're perfect. That's right. You ain't. There are things about me probably drive some of y'all out of your mind. It's probably why you don't come eat with us after church. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I put up with them enough in church. I don't want to go eat with them. Good God, Hemmers, I'll lose my appetite. That's why when we go to eat, all I have is toast and tea because the preacher done ruined my appetite. <laughs> Listen, I'm not, I'm not foolish, folks. I'm very realistic. I know that I have... A personality that doesn't always ride with everybody, just perfect. I know that. I'm not stupid. I understand that. Got news for you? There are people in every church I've ever pastored, and I keep reminding people, when I preach stuff, don't immediately think, oh, he's saying that because. Don't think that I've pastored a lot of people. I've been through a whole lot of experiences. Just because you can think of one and you say, oh, that's what he's talking about. No, 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 no. I, I've had a lot more experience. I've had a lot of experience with people leaving the church because they're mad at the preacher. But I'm here to tell you today, we need to act like Christians. We need to learn to live like Christians, you know. When God wants us, there aren't a whole lot of affirming churches that preach this message that we preach. And if you believe this message we preach, then you ought to be pretty committed to this church. And if the pastor ticks you off, you ought to be pretty committed to going ahead and trying to, to fix the problem rather than jumping ship. Because if you jump ship, there ain't a dozen other churches in town you can go to that preach this message. Hello now, my right. telling the truth. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, if I knew of an affirming Pentecostal apostolic church and I was going to it and the preacher ticked me off, I would not abandon ship too regularly, too readily because uh-uh, there ain't there'd be no other church for me to go to that preaches this message. And I want to be part of a church that preaches this message. So God called Moses apart to have a conversation and every time God wanted to talk to him Moses had to climb the mountain whenever Jesus wanted to pray what did he do well he took the 12 apostles with him nope they come with him so far they might go to the location where he was at the garden of Gethsemane but then the Bible said from there he took Peter, James, and John. So now he has 12 apostles, 12 disciples, but now he narrows it down to three. I'm going to tell you something. Be careful who you pray with. Be careful who you pray with. I don't want to pray with a bunch of people who don't know how to pray. I don't want to pray with a bunch of people who don't have any faith. I don't want to pray with a bunch of people who are just going to sit there and rap, tap, tattle, tattle, and, and not, not really touch the Lord. No. I want to pray with people who have faith. The Bible said, if two or three agree as touching any one thing, it shall be done unto them of our Father which is in heaven. Johnny, I want to pray with people who agree with me that God can do what I need the Lord to do. Am I telling the truth? Yeah. You want people to pray with you who know how to touch the Lord. When you ask somebody to pray with you or to pray for you, you don't just ask anybody. You ask somebody you have confidence in. Am I telling the truth? Well, Jesus would take his 12 disciples. They'd go to the Garden of Gethsemane. Then he'd say, okay, you nine wait here. Peter, James, and John, you come with me. He'd go a little further. Then guess what he did? Read your Bible. The Bible said then he left Peter, James, and John here, and he went a little further yet. He would separate himself from Peter, James, and John. You know why we have prayer meetings at churches? So we can pray together about things. So we can bring our faith together. So we can raise our voices together in prayer and in praise to God. But that doesn't mean that we're going to join hands and make a circle when we have our prayer meeting. No, when we have our prayer meeting, this one goes to the pew and prays. This one goes to the altar and prays. This one lays on the floor and prays. This one goes over here and does this and prays. You follow what I'm saying? We're all in the same building. We're all in the same environment. But isn't it funny how people will still kind of separate themselves? They'll still go off in a corner somewhere to pray. 
You hear what I'm telling you? See, we're following Jesus' example because God does his best work, oh hallelujah, for the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Whew, the, the thought God just gave me Bless my, ooh, it bless my soul just as it touched my mind. God does his best work in intimacy. How do you like that? When does your partner, your spouse, your husband, your wife, when do they communicate with you the best? When do you most hear things from them that you're grateful to hear? When you're intimate. When you're all alone. When you're getting sweet with one another. When the kisses are flowing. Of course, now, I'm, I'm only going by what I've heard. I don't experience this. <laughs> Tell another one. Tell another one. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Am I telling the truth? That's when your spouse says, I love you. You're so special. I can't imagine my life without you. Of course, just three hours ago, they were saying, you big jerk, I don't know why I even wasted my time with you. Why, boy, bless God, you know, I could have been with this one. You remember that one there? I could have been with that one. Am I telling the truth? But when you're intimate, when you finally get alone, and you put aside all the other distractions, now you can convey things from your heart. You can say things that a lot of times you have a hard time saying. It's like in public. Can I say I love my booby with all my heart? That he's my life and my world. And I can't imagine my world without him. And the very thought of him not being in it scares the death out of me. Can I say that in public? Whoop, I guess it just did. <laughs> but you know, it's a lot of times it's hard to say that in front of people, isn't it? It's hard to say those kind of things. It means more. Huh? It means more. It does. It means a lot more. But you know what? You, you let us get in private, you let us get intimate, and then all of a sudden I'm able to say those things. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yeah. Peter separated himself just like Jesus had separated himself. Peter separated himself just like Moses had separated himself so that he could pray and he could seek the face of the Lord. While he was up on that housetop, he got hungry. You know, I'm going to tell you a little secret. If you think just because you're praying that all your earthly needs are going to disappear, no, you're still going to get hungry. You're still going to get distracted. Hello now. Even when you're by yourself, you're still going to get distracted. This is why we believe as apostolic Pentecostal people in what we refer to as getting in the Spirit. The Bible refers to it in our primary text today as Peter fell into a trance. Okay, He literally went into the Spirit. In other words, he was praying, but he got to a place in his praying that he literally, in a sense, I'm not talking about, you know, uh, spectral, what do you call it, you know, Projection. I'm not talking about it. But in a sense, he got out of his body and was totally absorbed in what was going on in his spirit. Yes. When you do that, guess what? All of a sudden, what's happening in your body, you don't even think about it. I grew up in the Pentecostal church. I remember church services, the Spirit of the Lord would get to moving in that church. Whoo, I mean, the Holy Ghost would be falling. We'd be having church. And you know what, uh, Bill? Of course, I'm going to scare Bill to death. He said, Lord, I hope this church will never get there. I'm still, I'm still trying to drag that old Methodist spirit out of him, you know. But <laughs> I'm teasing. But, you know, but literally, Bill, we would start at 7 o'clock on Sunday night. All of a sudden, my mother and my grandmother look at their watch. It'd be 1 o'clock in the morning. And say, my God, I had no idea. I had no idea it was 1 o'clock in the morning. We had been in church for six hours. Time went by. We didn't, we didn't even know that time had gone by. You know why? Because we weren't in the flesh. We were in the spirit. Do you follow what I'm saying? And this is what happened to Peter. Peter fell into the spirit. 
This is one reason why intimacy and breaking apart from all the distractions, and I'm going to say this today, Amy, honey, you especially need to hear what I'm saying right now. You need to pull away from all the distractions. Let mom watch the kids. Let, let the boyfriend watch the kids, you know. Do what you got to do to get away and separate yourself. Get in your car and drive somewhere quiet and somewhere that, that nobody's around. Of course, be safe. Don't be unsafe. But, you know, and pray in the car. Turn on some music that lifts up the name of the Lord, music that blesses you. And then begin to seek the Holy Ghost and ask God, Lord, I need you to fill me with your power. I've got things in my life that I'm struggling with. I need your power. I need the power to overcome. I need the power to be a witness and a testimony for you. And just see if God don't answer that prayer in your intimate time. But be able to be in a place where you can get in the Spirit. If you've got things around you that are constantly going to beckon you back into your body, so to speak, beckon you back into the flesh, remind you that you're, you, know, you still have a flesh and blood body wrapped around you, then, honey, you can't get in the Spirit that way. You need to be in a place where you don't have all that distraction. This is what Peter did. And while Peter was in that state, when Peter went into the Spirit and he began to pray in the Spirit, all of a sudden, God was able to show him something that he had never seen before. And out of the sky came a sheet, as it were. And the four corners were all kind of brought together. So he couldn't see what was in the sheet until it hit the ground. And the four corners fell open. And on that sheet, the Bible said, were all manner of four-footed beasts and creeping things and birds. All manner. Mm. You know why I got a pig up here? Because there was a pig on that sheet. You know what Jews were not permitted to eat because of the law of Moses? Pig, pork. They couldn't touch the stuff. But there was a pig on that sheep. God said, arise, Peter, kill and eat. Come on, Peter, anything on this sheep, you want to eat it? Kill it and eat it. Anything. Well, wait a minute, God. You're offering me stuff that the law says I can't touch. I've never eaten anything unclean. I've never eaten anything Common. Common is a term that is synonymous with unclean. If you ever watch the British comedies, you'll notice that it's kind of a, a put down, so to speak, when someone will say, oh, she's so common. Mm -hmm. Or there's one little lady uh, on the, that one about the, the department store, are you being served? And there's that one little lady who works with Mrs. Slocum. And boy, you know, she talks just like, she, almost like she caught me, you know. Well, I know I'm a lot more common than others. What is she talking about? Common means you're, you come from the lowest class. You come from the dredges, you know. You're, you're uh, to be common is to suggest that that your value compared to gold is about right up there with sand. <laughs> Why? Because sand is a whole lot more common than gold is. Am I telling the truth? Sure. Sand is a whole lot more common than diamonds are. Well, so when you call something common, you're saying, uh, you can find that old trash anywhere. That, that, that has no value whatsoever. Peter said, Lord, I've never eaten anything common. I've never eaten anything unclean according to the standard of the law. And God spoke and said, Peter, what I have called clean, don't you dare call it common. Well, the sheep rises up in the air. All of a sudden, the Lord looks at that. Peter didn't get it yet. Down comes the sheep again. Opens up again. Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Oh, Lord, no, no. I told you already, I've never eaten anything uncommon. Or unclean. Peter, what I've called common, don't you dare. Excuse me, what I've called clean, don't you dare call com common. She goes up again. Lord, look. <sighs> That's about the most stubborn duck I've ever had to deal with. <laughs> he still don't get it. 
down comes that sheep one more time. And once again, they have this conversation. And the Lord says, Peter, what I've cleansed, don't you dare call common. What I've cleansed. I wouldn't offer it to you unless I had done something to it. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. I, I hope you hear me because where I'm going with this, said, I, I wouldn't offer it to you if I hadn't made it clean for you. So even though in your eyes it looks unclean, I wouldn't have offered you something unclean. If I offered it to you, then I've cleansed it. Mm -hmm. Right? Said, so don't you call anything that I have cleansed unclean or common. And that sheep goes up in the air, and just about then Peter kind of stirs from his spiritual uh, state. And he's hungry. He said, well, it's time to get down off the roof. He goes down into the house. And who should be at the door? But men who have come to find a guy named Peter at this address. That an angel had spoken to their boss. And told, them to, told him to send for this man named Peter. And here's where you'll find him. And that man was a Roman. Oh my goodness. Not only was he a Roman citizen, he was a soldier in the Roman army. Oh, I'm going to tell you something. There was nobody on this planet that the Jews hated worse than a Roman soldier. Mm -hmm. There was, oh, they, they hated, they hated old Pilate, they hated old Caesar. I'm going to tell you, if you think the Jews worship Pilate and Caesar the way Christians in the church today are worshiping Trump, <laughs> no, 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 no. No, they looked at them as being evil men who, who were, uh, you know, uh, ruling their country and who were in charge of their country and their land. And they understood these were evil men. It didn't matter if Pilate did good things or bad things. Hello now. It didn't matter if Pilate did good things for them or bad things for them. It didn't matter. The bottom line is he was unclean. He was unholy. He was a, a, a not Pilate. Pilate was out of their own number, actually. You know, the Romans would use somebody from amongst their own nation in order to be a governor over them. They didn't put a Roman over them. They put a Jew over them. Pilate actually came from Jewish background. But old Caesar... You know what his reputation was? He was a womanizer. He was a partier. He was somebody that had orgies and engaged in all kinds of uncleanness. He didn't fear God. He filled his own pockets in order to profit himself. My goodness, it almost sounds like I'm describing modern day politicians almost. <laughs> And if you think for one minute that the Jews ran around saying, Oh, yes, make Israel great. Mm -mm. They understood what Caesar was. Now, did Caesar ever do things for them? Did Caesar ever do things benevolently for, on behalf of the Oh, absolutely. Because he was trying to keep them happy. He didn't want an uprising. He didn't want those people turning against him because then he was going to have to send in soldiers and they were going to have to fight a war and wars cost money. So, hey, if all I got to do is do these people a favor once in a while in order to keep them appeased, that ain't a big thing. I can do that. So don't you know we got politicians today? Hey, all I got to do is throw these dingbats a bone every once in a while, and I can be the most unholy, ungodly thing that ever walked the face of the earth. As long as I throw them a bone once in a while, they're just going to go along with whatever I do. Am I telling the truth? That, folks, let me tell you, the world hadn't changed much. But these men had come from Cornelius' house seeking Peter, and... They're telling Peter, you know, an angel spoke to our boss and told us to come to this location. Well, now, honey, I got news for you. There are some things that happen, and you just know it has to be God. How else would they have known to go to that address? How else would they have known to ask for a man named Peter at that address? How could they possibly have known? Listen carefully now that God had already been preparing Peter for this meeting while he was up on the rooftop. Because if Peter hadn't had that little discussion with God, he'd have been nowhere ready. 
to be invited into the home of a Roman soldier. Mm -hmm. So they tell Peter all that, and, and Peter says, you know what? Doggone it, I just had a, I just had a vision on the mountain. He didn't say this out loud, I'm sure. I, I, I wasn't there, so I can't say for sure. But I'm pretty sure he didn't say this out loud. But he probably was thinking, now, I just had that vision up on the roof. And God said, what I've called clean, don't you dare call common. We tend to look at the Romans as unclean. We tend to look at the Romans as common, especially the old Roman soldiers. Well, they're in our country. They're, they're trying to uh, you know, occupy our country and rule our nation by force. Oh, I hate those people. Normally, we look at them as being the most common, ugly things in our country. But God told me, what I've cleansed, don't you dare call did God cleanse Cornelius? Well, he must have because he made way for them to know how to find Peter, didn't he? Mm -hmm. See, Peter wasn't stupid. He said, now listen, if God sent him to me, just like that sheet, if God put it down there, then that means that he wants me to go to him. The law says I'm not supposed to. But the law also said I wasn't supposed to eat anything on that sheet. But God said, what I've cleansed, don't you dare call it common or unclean. So that means that if God made a way for Cornelius to know where I'm at, at my address, by my name, then God must have made that man ready for me to go in and see him. He must have made him clean somehow, am I telling the truth? That's right. So Peter agreed to go to the house of Cornelius. He goes to the house of Cornelius, and Cornelius explains to him that I've been very curious, and I've been interested in your God, and I've been interested in your religion, uh, the Jewish religion, mind you. So I've been interested in this, and I was praying to your God. I wasn't praying to my God. And people around Cornelius began to explain to Peter, you know what, Peter? Uh, Cornelius is a very devout man. He's a very religious man. He's, this is somebody who really believes in God. Remember what I told you before? You've got to be careful about condemning people who aren't part of the one God Jesus named faith just because they're not part of our, our denomination or they're not part of our movement. That doesn't mean that what they do have is not valid. Mm -hmm. sure. The Bible said if we're to come to God, we must first believe that he is. Obviously, Cornelius believed that he is, that God existed. Secondly, we have to believe that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Cornelius was seeking him. And when the angel of the Lord said, hey, I know somebody can provide you the answers you're looking for, did Cornelius say, well, no, I'm not going to go to all that trouble. I'm not going to bother with all that effort. No, he did exactly what the angel did. Why? Because he believed that God would reward him if he would diligently seek him. Am I telling the truth? So Cornelius was right on track. There are a lot of believers today who are in Trinitarian churches. I'll be honest with you. There are a lot of believers today who are in churches, Baptist churches, Methodist churches, Episcopal churches, Presbyterian churches, even Catholic churches. And they're on track. They may be in the wrong car, but they're, they're on the right track. Mm -hmm. Don't discount what little bit they got just because they don't have everything. Do you hear what I'm telling you? See, right. you, you can't help everybody get the whole meal if you dissuade them from eating just because they're still on hors d'oeuvres. Hello now. Uh -huh. Amen. No, don't ever discourage anybody from pursuing God wherever they're at in their walk with God. As long as they're on the right track, then eventually they'll find the destination. Am I telling the truth? Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So Peter begins to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to those who were in the house of Cornelius. And you would not believe the response that Peter gets. In Acts chapter 10 verses 44 through 48. While Peter yet spake these words, meaning while he was still preaching, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. My goodness. Not only did the Holy Ghost fall on Cornelius, who had sent for Peter, who had heard from the angel, but it fell on his wife. It fell on his children. It fell on the neighbors who had come over to hear what Peter had to say. Oh, hallelujah. All these commoners, all 
these unclean people. And the Holy Ghost fell on all of them. And they of the circumcision, meaning the Jewish Christians, which believed, were astonished. As many as came with Peter. A bunch of Jewish Christians had come with Peter to Cornelius' house. Why? Because on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. How did they know that Cornelius had received the Holy Ghost? Well, in the Baptist church, Johnny, this is how you know. Oh, I got it. I guess everybody in the room just stood there and said, I got it. No, here's how they knew. Verse 46, For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. See, when you get the Holy Ghost, you speak with other tongues. That's how you know you got the Holy Ghost. That's how they knew that Cornelius had received the Holy Ghost. How? They heard them all start talking in tongues. They said, my God, hey, hey, the same thing that happened to us on the day of Pentecost just happened to these unclean, these Gentiles. Oh, there was no worse statement you could make about somebody than to call them a Gentile. Gentile meant that everything related to the Jewish faith didn't even touch you, had nothing to do with you. Especially the gospel, oh my goodness. No, God promised Messiah through the Jewish people. Yeah, he promised Messiah through the Jewish people, but he also then promised that Messiah, that through Abraham's seed, what? All the nations of the world would be blessed. See, they lost sight of that. Once they had Messiah, they thought Messiah was all theirs. They thought that Jesus was there for the Jewish people. They forgot that the Lord said, Go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel, listen to me now, to every creature. Isn't it funny? The Lord didn't say to every Jew. Listen carefully. He didn't say to every person. He said to every creature. Why did he say to every creature? I'll tell you why. Because when the Jews looked at the Gentiles, when they looked at the Romans, when they looked at Cornelius, this is what they saw. They didn't see a human. They saw a pig. You remember when Jesus had that little woman chasing after him? And she said, Lord, my daughter's grievously vexed with the devil. I need you to do something for her. And the Lord looked at her and said, I've not come but for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And she was discouraged and she fell back a few steps. And then she came forward and she said, Lord, my daughter's grievously vexed with the devil and I know you can do something about it. And he said, uh, lady, you don't understand. It is not a good thing to take the children's food and throw it in front of the dogs. Ooh. Ooh. Hitler called the Jews rats. So you want to dehumanize the enemy. You don't want, if you're trying to make somebody look bad, the, the thing you want to do is try to make them look unhuman. There was one point during the reign of our current president where he literally made the statement, these people aren't even human. Oh, you don't say that about somebody. You can't get any more offensive than to say they're not even human. Do you follow what I'm saying? Before the Dred Scott decision of the Supreme Court, black people in America, slaves, they were not viewed as humans. Even after the decision, guess what? They were assigned a percentage of humanity. Three-fifths is human. The other, the other two-fifths, we don't know what it is. Pig, dog, spit, whatever. Do you follow what I'm telling you? Jesus said to this woman, it's not good to take the children's food and cast it to the dogs. He literally was calling her a dog. He was comparing her to a dog. That is how the Jews saw the Gentiles as animals. I'm not kidding. That's why, that's why the Lord said, go ye therefore and all the world and preach the gospel to every 
creature, even what you don't perceive as a human, I want you to preach to it anyway. Hallelujah. Go ye into all the world. He, he, there were Jews all over the known world. There were Jews that lived in Rome. There were Jews that lived in Colossus. There were Jews that lived in Greece. There were Jews that lived in Turkey. There were Jews that lived all over planet Earth. And But he didn't want them just to preach to the Jews. He wanted them to preach to every creature. They didn't understand that great command. And then Peter's up on the housetop, and what does God show him? Listen, how is it described to us? It says, the sheep came down wherein were all manner of four-footed beasts of the earth and wild beasts and creeping things and fowls of the air. All manner. All manner. All different kinds. There were some that were so ugly. I don't know about you all, but I'm not a big fan of snakes. <laughs> now, I can look at some of the ugliest uh, animals on the planet and find something cute about them. You know, you look at a sloth. I think sloths are about the most homely animal God ever created. They got a little rounded off nose. They got a little tiny head, you know. They, they're just funky looking little buggers. And I can look at a sloth and I can still think it's cute in its own little homely way. But you show me a great big old python, I don't see nothing pretty about a snake. I'm sorry. Nope. I don't see nothing pretty about spiders. You can take every spider on the planet and spray it with rain, and this preacher will be perfectly happy. I don't have no use for spiders in the world. But in this sheet were all manner of creatures. Am I telling the truth? While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter. Because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. How they know for they heard them speak with tongues. And magnify God. When you speak with other tongues, you're not, you're not worshiping Satan. You're not worshiping the devil. You're magnifying God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? My baptism apparently was pretty important to his message. And he commanded them, he didn't suggest, he commanded them to be baptized. How? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost? No, he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. That's why we preach in Jesus' name baptism. That's why we preach the Holy Ghost baptism. Peter had been told by God, mind your manners. Mind your manners. Mind how you treat things. What you perceive as unclean and unholy. If I've cleansed it, don't you dare call it unclean or unholy. Mind your manners. And I tell them the truth today. That's where I got my title from. So you know, now you're up to speed, okay? Mind your manners. Watch how you react to people. Watch how you react to individuals. I got news for you, church, today. Mind your manners. You better watch how you deal with gay people. You better watch how you deal with LGBT people. You better watch how you deal with the mentally ill. You better watch how you deal with those who have emotional issues. You better watch how you deal with the divorcee or those who are struggling you better watch. You may see them as one of them ugly beasts on the sheet. You may define them. Well, I tell you what. I think queer's about the worst thing that ever was. Think they're about as unholy as anything that ever existed. Really? My Bible tells me that all manner of beasts were in the sheet. All manner. What you perceive is the worst, they were there too. God didn't just pick some <laughs> God didn't just pick some unclean beasts and put them on that sheet and call them clean. No, he put all of them, 
all manner. Do you hear what I'm telling you today? All manner. Oh, honey, you better watch out. Billy Graham's son, Franklin Graham. I don't even want to tell you my opinion about that character. I will say this, and, and probably you know risk trouble for saying it, but I believe with all my heart he's one of the biggest false prophets that ever hit the church. I'm going to tell you that much. But that man has gotten up and said that LGBT people who claim to be Christians are the enemy of the church. He literally said that. They're the enemy of the church. You know why? Because you're the dirtiest creature he's ever laid eyes on. Well, I got news for you. Oh, Franklin Graham got news for you. Two things. Number one, what God has cleansed, don't you dare call common. And number two, love your enemies. So if we are the enemy of the church, then guess what? God has specifically <laughs> commanded you to love us. You have no excuse for hating on us. You have no excuse for your homophobic behavior. You have no excuse for being ugly. You have no excuse for being critical and judgmental and negative. You have no excuse whatsoever. God has specifically commanded you to love your enemies. Am I telling the truth? That's right. Oh boy, I'll tell you, see, God don't leave loopholes. We got loopholes in our political system. We got loopholes in our uh, immigration system. We got loopholes in our legal system. I'm going to tell you something. God sews up every loophole. There ain't, there ain't a loophole in the world that you can crawl through and be a child of God. Because God makes sure every loophole is sewed up. That's why he said, go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's why he said to Peter, that which I have called clean, don't you dare call it unclean or common. That is why he said, love your enemies. That is why he said, pray for them which spitefully use you. Am I telling the truth? There ain't no loopholes, honey. You, you got no excuse but to live your life as a child of God. And everything you do and say ought to be governed by love. That's why when people come at me sometimes, and they come at me with accusatory tones and nasty tones, you know, I try to come back to them with love. What can I do? Is there some way I can fix this? Is there something I can do about it? You know what I'm saying? I, I'm not going to come back and say, Well, bless God, you did it, you did You know, and, and just make an argument. I know. If I'm going to live like Jesus lived, and I'm going to be what I'm supposed to be, then I'm going to let love dictate my response. Am I telling the truth? <sighs> Listen to me now. The Word of God said in James chapter 5, I'm trying to move right along. James chapter 2, I'm sorry, verses 1 through 9, the Lord said, uh, James wrote, I'm sorry, the brother of the Lord said, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. See, Tommy, there's no way in the world he's talking about sir. The term Lord being sir. Say, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. There's only one you describe as the Lord of glory, and that is God. He said, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring in goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves? And are become judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren. Hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him? 
but ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats. Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which ye are called. If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Ye do well. But if ye have respect to persons, listen, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. Ooh, you're not supposed to show partiality. You're not supposed to judge by outward appearance. Remember that little lady I told you about a little while ago that had come to my third church, my first apostolic work, and she stank to high heaven, and I mean literally, for I'm not kidding, folks. Bless her heart, she lived with dozens of cats and a little trailer that honestly was about as big as this room right here. And she didn't have good running water. She didn't have nothing. That lady come, I mean, she hadn't washed her clothes probably in weeks. And her hair was disastrous. And she hadn't had a bath. And she'd come to church and she stunk so bad. You could smell her literally on the other side of the sanctuary. And you want to know something? Not one time did anybody in our church ever tell her where she could sit. Not one time did we ever say to her, Sister, do me a favor. Would you sit back here on the back pew? No. If she wanted to sit on the front pew, she'd come sit on the front pew. Y'all been in this church long enough. You know we have people who have come and come to our church. I'm, you know, going to try to deal with this genteelly. They don't look the best. They're not the richest. They don't put one nickel in the offering plate. Not one dime. They've come for years and have never put nothing in the offering plate. But you know what? Doesn't matter. Have we ever told them you can't sit on the front pew? We've had individuals come to our church who have conditions, physical conditions, that cause their appearance to be kind of hard for some people to look at. And have we ever told them where they could sit? No, sir, we haven't. And where did they want to sit? Right up on front. Right up in the front. Had people come into our church, had some mental health issues, you know, things weren't all, you know, really tightened up real good. And sometimes they'd laugh when there wasn't nothing to laugh about, or they'd say something when it was inappropriate to say something. And did we ever tell them where they could sit in church? Not one time. You see, that's the way God's people behave. That's the way the church behaves. If you don't have anything to say, offer something constructive. After this lady come to our church for, oh heavens, probably several weeks to a couple of months, Sister Johnson asked her, she said, Honey, did, did your water run good at your trailer? And she said, No, it doesn't. She said, I have to go. I think she had a pump, you know, one of them old hand pumps, you know. said, I have to go out and pump drinking water and all that. And Sister Johnson said, Well, how about this? Said, how about, would you, would you like me to come on Saturday and pick you up? And I'll bring you to my house and you can take a nice shower and get clean and bring laundry. If you got laundry needs doing, bring it and we'll wash it together and, and, uh, you can use my soap, you can use my conditioner, you know. And that little lady was happy to take advantage of that, okay? And, but you see, there's always a good positive way to do things. And we didn't offer it right away because we didn't want to offend her. We didn't want to assault her. We wanted her to be there long enough to know that if we were offering something, we were offering it out of the goodness of our heart, not because, you know, we're not going to accept you in our church unless you do thus and so. She knew she was welcome. If she said no, thank you, she'd still have been welcome. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? Right. James said, you sin if you show any kind of preference over one person than another person. You see, what God has called clean, don't you dare call common. What God has cleansed, don't you dare call common. Anybody that wants to know God, anybody that wants to worship God, anybody that wants to walk in relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ is welcome in this 
church. That is our policy. That is why we are called affirming. That is why we are called open. That is why we are called inclusive. Does that necessarily mean that the way everybody does everything I approve of or I believe is scriptural? No, not at all. But you know what? We all got to start somewhere. We all got to grow. We all got to learn. I had a guy come to church one time a while back who informed me that he believed in plural relationships. Mm -hmm. You know, he believed in being with a number of people, and he asked me, does that exclude me from your church? I said, no, sir. No. He said, do you accept, do you believe in plural ways? I said, no, sir. <laughs> I don't. I don't. But our door is open to you. If you want to come to church, you come to church. You follow what I'm telling you? See, nobody's going to find the whole light unless they can at least first see the night light. Mm -hmm. Hello now. That's right. Amen. You ain't gonna you ain't gonna attract people to the whole message. You're never gonna help them learn the whole truth. When when uh, Paul first came upon Priscilla and Aquila, Priscilla and Aquila were believers, but they didn't have the whole Pentecostal message. They didn't have the whole a knowledge of the whole gospel. And the word of God said, Paul called them aside and said, let me explain this thing to you more perfectly, meaning more completely. Let me fill you in. There's, there's some points that you're missing. There are some things you're not aware of. And he helped them understand the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And he helped them to understand things that at that point they had not yet understood. But what would have happened if Paul come along and said, oh no, I don't want these people in my church. They don't believe the Way I believe. I don't want to. No, these people, they're not where they need to be. I want to tell you, there's a lot of churches, God forgive me, especially in the Pentecostal faith, that's just exactly the way they act. If you don't dress the way we dress, if you don't look the way we look, if you don't do the way we do, then bless God, you're not welcome in this fellowship. And they don't give anybody room to grow. No, that sister can't come to church who wears her eye makeup. That sister can't come to church who wears her earrings. No, bless God, we don't believe in those things. I don't care what you wear. I don't care if you got that. I, 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 God forgive me. I hope nobody's watching who does this. But if you are, understand everything I'm saying. Don't jump the, the gun. I can't stand them ear stretching things people put in their ears. You know, their earlobe. And next thing you know, they got a huge hole in the side of their earlobe. And, you know, you're looking through. Though I don't like those things. Though, to me, they're just the weirdest looking, strangest things, you know. But if somebody wants to come to church has them, I could care less. I could care less. I'm disgusted by things, God forgive me, like goiters, you know, big old goiter on somebody's neck. Things like that tend to like make me just almost want to get sick to my stomach. We've had people come to church, had issues that literally made me sick to my stomach. Physical issues. I don't know why I have certain issues with certain things, but I do. I can't help it. It's just, it's in me. You know, there are certain conditions that I, when I was a kid growing up, I knew a girl had one arm missing. She was born with one arm missing. And her little arm, bless its heart, she had like a ball on the end of her arm, you know, just after the joint. She had like a ball there. And every time she'd come in the cafeteria when I was a kid, you know, and I'd look at her arm, I immediately lost my appetite. I don't know why. I, and I'm, yeah, honestly, I don't know why. I have no idea why. Who among us knows why we do a lot of things we do, you know? But you know what? I've had people come into this very church that had issues that for years I couldn't even look at people that had those issues. And you know what? I'm hugging their neck and I'm loving on them. Oh my goodness. Because I'll be hanged if I'm going to sin and show partiality against them. Do you follow what I'm saying? I'll be hanged if I'm not going to treat them like I treat everybody else in the church. No, I refuse to be convinced of sin. Am I telling the truth today? I mind my manners. I mind what manner of person I look at as unclean or unholy. I mind what manner of person I look at as being preferable or preferred in the church. Lastly today, 2 Corinthians 6 verses 14 through 18. 
This is the passage many people use as an excuse to be, uh, to mistreat certain groups of people. Word of God said, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Mind you, he's comparing gods here. What concord hath Christ with Belial? He's comparing Christ with the false god Baal. Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them. And be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not, listen to the language, the unclean thing. And I will receive you. And will be a father unto you. And ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Ooh, God has told us, have not to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. He has told us to come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord of hosts. That gives me license to sit in judgment of your every behavior. That gives me license to sit in judgment of the way you do everything and everything you believe and everything you do. No, it does not. That is not even close to what the apostle is talking about in this passage. He is specifically addressing the issue of idolatry. He is not talking about sexual issues. He is not talking about behavioral issues. He is talking about what you believe and who you worship. And furthermore, he is talking about coming into union with those things. He said, be ye not unequally yoked together with. To be yoked together with means that you have been tied together for a singular purpose. He said, don't you join yourselves to a bunch of people who don't believe in Jesus. Don't you join yourself to people who don't worship the Lord. I can go into a church that doesn't preach the one God Jesus name message. Now they may preach a lot of good stuff and a lot of stuff that's right. I can go in that church and worship with them. Why? Are, do they meet this criteria? No. They're not unbelievers. Hello now. They're not unbelievers. They're not infidels. No. Just because they don't believe the fullness of what I believe doesn't mean that they don't believe a lot of what's right if I tell them the truth. I can go in there and worship the Lord because they're worshiping Jesus. I'm worshiping Jesus. Just because they have a different understanding of Jesus than I do doesn't mean they're not worshiping the Lord. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? See, you've got to be careful about trying to point to Scripture and use Scripture as an excuse for bad manners. Well, the Bible tells me, come out from a, I can't have my, my gay grandson in my home. I can't have my gay brother and his partner in my home because the Bible tells me to be separate and to touch not the unclean thing. Oh, what, what did he tell you not to touch? The unclean thing. Remember what I told you about God sewing up loopholes? <laughs> Remember what I told you about there are no loopholes in the kingdom of God? The Lord said, if I've called it clean, don't you dare call it uncommon or unclean. Oh, you have no excuse. Am I telling the truth? You have no excuse. When Peter went into the home of Cornelius, was Cornelius already a Christian? Was he already converted? Was he already a child of God? No. Did he qualify according to the law as an unclean person? Yes, he did. Peter went into the house, and the very first thing Peter said when he went into Cornelius' house, according to the law, I shouldn't be here. 
That was the first thing he told the house of Cornelius. He said, let me tell you folks something. According to the law of Moses, I'm not supposed to go into the home of someone who is not part of our nation, who is not part of our country, somebody who is not of our lineage and our faith. That was the first thing he said. He said, but God showed me. God showed me that anything he's cleansed, I am not to call unclean or common. You better be careful of your manners. You better mind your manners. You better watch out how you treat people. I'm going to tell you something. You ever think you're going to win that gay couple next door? Or you're ever going to win your brother who happens to be gay or your sister who happens to be lesbian? If you ever think you're going to win them to Christ and faith in Jesus Christ by isolating them and ostracizing them, mistreating them, criticizing them, if you think that through bad manners you're going to be a testimony and a witness to them, I'm going to say this in plain English, you're a class A jackass. That's right. You're a donkey of the highest order. You will never reach anybody through hatefulness. You will never be a testimony to anybody through judgmentalness or criticalness. That's why the loophole was sewed up when God said, judge not, least to be judged. Hello now. I told you there are no loopholes. You, you, every time you think you got a loophole, God has done sewed it up tight. Said, no, honey, I, I, you ain't got a loophole there. I told you, judge not least to be judged. I told you, don't you dare call anything I've called clean, uncommon. I told you, go into all the world and preach to every creature. How can you preach to every creature if you won't even stay in the room? I've got an aunt who thinks she's so holy, she's a Baptist. Fundamentalist Baptist, Southern Baptist. She's so holy that when I would go visit my grandmother, she would leave the room and go into another room to read her Bible because she's so holy. Of course, when she wanted to bring her kids to New York City so she could show them a good time, she didn't think nothing of calling me and asking me if I'd mind bringing her kids around New York City. And, and her, mind you, she came with them. And what did I do? Because, you know, after all, I'm mad at her for, for treating me bad. So I treated her bad, right? No, because the Word of God said I'm to love my enemies. says I'm to treat those well that mistreat me, that I'm not to respond to evil with evil, but I'm to respond to evil with good. Am I telling the truth? So here I am. I'm not the fundamentalist Baptist. She is. I'm the gay Christian. And you know what? I'm the one that acts more Christ-like than she does. She calls me, says, I want to come to New York City. I know you've had other family come and spend time with you, and you've shown them around. Would you mind taking me and my kids around? I said, sure, come on. She come a couple of times. One time, she stood in my living room and decided to tell me that she didn't agree with my lifestyle. She didn't agree with my relationship. And, blah, 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 blah. and I said, honey, got news for you. You see where you're standing? This ain't your house. See where you're standing? This ain't your living room. You know what? Your thoughts and your opinions are welcome in your living room. You can mistreat me all you want to when you're standing in your house. But when you're in my house, sweetheart, here's what happens when you start talking this trash. I get on the phone and I call a cab. And I did just that. And I sent her packing. I said, nope, you're not going to disrespect me in my home. You think, you think you can do it at Grandma's because at that point she and her husband had bought the house from my grandmother who was now widowed and they were living there as well. You know, I said, in your house you can treat me any old dirty way you want to treat me. Honey, when you're in my house, you're going to respect me or you're going to leave. I wasn't being hateful. See, some people, Johnny, think because you speak your mind that you're being hateful. No. Uh -uh. I'm sorry, I don't look at it that way. If I'm upset with you and I look you right square in the eye and say, I don't like the way you're coming at me. I don't appreciate the way you're saying that. You know, I'm not being hateful, but I'm telling you exactly how I feel about what you're doing and what you're saying. You know what I'm saying? I'm not trying to be hateful, but I believe in speaking my mind. Because you ain't going to be able to say, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it that way or whatever, unless I tell you that I'm, you know, not happy with the way you're coming at me. Am I telling the truth? Right. So the best way to fix the problem is i got to let you know there is a problem. <laughs> so if I say, I, I don't like the way you're coming at me, you know, you may think, well, wait a minute, that's not the way I meant it at all. I'm sorry. You know, do, you, do you follow what I'm saying? Yeah. 
trying to tell you today, folks, there's no excuse for bad manners. There's no excuse for bad manners. The Word of God said bad manners corrupts communication. You want to break off a line of communication? You want to destroy the opportunity to witness to somebody? You want to destroy an opportunity to reach somebody for Jesus? Just have bad manners. What are bad manners? Uh, how you look at what manner of beast a person is. You see them as an unclean beast. You see them as a pig. You see them as a dog. You see them as something that the law says you shouldn't have anything to do with. Um, I got news for you. I got news for you. God has said, don't you dare call it unclean. Mm -hmm. Don't you dare call that common. I've cleansed it. If I put it in your path, it's your neighbor. If it's your neighbor, I've commanded you to love your neighbor as yourself. There are no loopholes. They, they know little loops in the law that you can sneak through to mistreat somebody. There are no little loops you can jump through in order to exercise bad manners. There were all manner of four-footed beasts, and all manner of beasts and creeping things and fallen. They're all manner. The worst kind, the best kind prettiest and the ugliest. It don't matter how you see me. It don't matter how I see others. I have no excuse for bad manners. Hallelujah. Because what God has called clean, I better not dare call unclean or common. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord.